here, right? Okay, folks, so we got a good one today, I think. Great debate. Bait Trill versus 802.1 AQ, shortest path bridging. Whoa, SPB. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. What's this all about? So, Trill, shortest path bridging, really talking about extending and enlarging layer 2 Ethernet networks. <clears throat> Ethernet has been growing in popularity because of its increased speed, its reduced cost, can get tons of different ways to plug in devices together, it's easy to use, pretty much plug and play, right? Well, as our networks are growing larger, we find that spanning tree just isn't quite cutting it. It's not, not getting us what we want. We want better multipath, we want better redundancy, we want better stability, less oopses. So there are two prevalent solutions that have been coming out. We've got Trill. It's been coming out of the IETF. Stands for Transparent Interconnection of Lots of Links. And of course, 802.1aq, which is a designation given by the IEEE for Shortest Path Bridging. And apologies again, gentlemen, for the SBP. It is SPB. Um, I know. You can flog me later. So, um, what a couple things that that uh, both sides agree about here is that we need to build a larger layer two. There's enough demand for it and uh, we need some sort of encapsulation to make sure that we have compatibility with legacy protocols and just because that's what it's going to take to make this happen. Um, there's an unanimous, uh, unanimous agreement here that this new network needs to be controlled by some kind of link state distribution and um, and that's pretty much where we start to diverge. Now, how we're going to do that is, uh, is up for debate. Let me introduce you to our uh, speakers. So we have uh, actually quite a, uh, quite a well, uh, well pedigreed group of folks here. We have folks uh, with experience uh, with patents, writing RFCs, uh, ex protocol experience, writing protocols, and of course, network operators. So we have Donald Eastlake over here, coming from Stellar Switches, who's also um, on the IETF Trill working group. We have uh, Peter from Huawei, uh, Peter Ashwood-Smith, and Srikanth from Avaya and Paul from Alcatel Lucent, who are all active members of the 802.1 AQ working group. The um, way we're going to run this here is we're going to give you some introductory introductions to the actual protocols themselves. And I got it right this time. Um, if you're interested in more in-depth coverage of the protocols, yesterday um, both sides gave a uh, pretty good in-depth tutorials, um, about hour, hour and a half long tutorials. So you can go ahead and load up the slides or um, I don't know if the video's been archived yet. I think we got a video on those. Um, so you can find a lot, lot of good in-depth information there. I'm going to give you just some basics just to uh, give you the um, foundations for our conversations today. And then we're going to have um, a few minutes to contrast with the opposite solution. And uh, I collected a bunch of debating points that I'll be bringing up as time allows, and then some open time for Q&A. So um, the SPB folks won the coin toss last night, so they're going to go ahead and do the initial intro, and um, then uh, Donald will follow thereafter. So this is uh, shortest path bridging in four slides, so I uh, apologize if it's a little, a little quick, but like uh, we said, there, there's a lot of tutorial material out there available for you. Um, so what is 802.1aq shortest path bridging? It is a collection of industry standards put together in a novel way. It consists of an industry standard, widely deployed, vendor supported, test tool supported, Ethernet data planes, the 802.1ah and AD, so the Mac and Mac and the Q and Q data planes, combined with an industry standard, widely deployed Ethernet OANM test uh, suite, so the 802.1ag and also the uh, ITU 1731 suite of protocols. Combined, again, you're going to hear these words a lot, industry standard, widely deployed, ISIS, link state protocol, which we have only made very minor TLV extensions to. All right, so we're taking these three widely known industry standards and putting them together in a novel way. We're using these things to do uh, inputs to calculations, to provide inputs to calculations, and those calculations allow us to provide shortest path routing, um, equal, multiple equal cost shortest path routing, uh, and not only for unicast but also for multicast traffic, essentially allowing us to create very large numbers of layer two VPNs on much larger scales with native Ethernet routing and native Ethernet data paths, native Ethernet OANM. 
Um, tens of thousands, like I said, of services are possible because of the 802.1ah ICID. So the data path has this ICID. So we're not bounded by that 4K VLAN limit. What's the uh, statement? If, uh, if, if, if a constant is not obviously too large, it's probably too small. So that applies in spades in this, uh, in this space. Um, and we're building on top of tens of thousands of man years of engineering effort at the IEEE and extending it slightly. Some of the applications of this protocol include very large layer twos uh, in the data center, so large layer two fabrics, I'll talk a little bit about that, but in support of the, uh, the, the massive interest in virtualization and the cost savings that that brings in data centers. Uh, internet layer two exchanges is another area where this is very interesting technology. Metro Ethernet, a small Metro Ethernet or even a medium sized one could be, could be operated uh, with this technology. Wireless backhaul as well. Anywhere where layer two VPN is important, this is an applicable technology. So just a quick look at how, you, how we support a wider scope of virtualization and better routing in a data center. Um, 802.1aq allows us to, to put hundreds or even thousands of multi-terabit switches together. Uh, they can be put together with uh, connectivity, which we call uh, a fat tree. Essentially, it allows you to create a non-blocking connectivity between all of the different components within the, uh, uh, the switches within the data center. And that essentially allows you to have um, 100 or so terabit or maybe even more L um, logical switch within, within your data center. This protocol is completely compatible with all the 802.1 data center protocols. In fact, it's being developed in the room next door to the 802.1 uh, um, data center bridging folks. So we're working at the same, at the same uh, conferences. Subnet virtualization is a, is a major aspect here uh, of the data center and 802.1 AQ allows you to uh, go to a single point within the network, make it a member of a subnet or a layer two VPN, and it automatically, the subnet extends to contain or to extend to include that new member. Also, uh, members can be removed very easily and quickly by just, uh, by just simply a single point provisioning. As I mentioned, the Ethernet OANM is complete end-to-end -end Ethernet OANM here. Um, and the data path MAC and MAC is absolutely ideally suited for a data center. Uh, the isolation is one of the, the, the main goals in a data center and MAC and MAC does that for us uh, today without any new data path work. So visually, uh, just a, a, a quick slide to show you kind of what's going on here. Here's a 36 node network uh, running ISIS on all of these network to network links. Um, ISIS is advertises the topology. Uh, and the membership information, we then compute up to 16 shortest paths um, through this network, allowing us to have 16 uh, equal cost multipaths. Not only do we allow uh, the unicast traffic to flow on a shortest path, but we also allow the multicast traffic to flow on a shortest path. We only do learning at the edges, which is one of the goals of, uh, of scaling, of course. Uh, and again, it's a Mac and Mac data path. So here visually is what, what's going on. I have my shortest path tree there shown in, uh, in that pink color, which has been pre-computed by the, by the uh, protocol. Unknown multicast, uh, sorry, unknown unicast or multicast traffic arriving from an edge device is multicast using Mac and Mac encapsulation specifically only to the interested members of that layer two VPN. We learn at the edge the association between the incoming, the incoming traffic uh, client address or the host uh, MAC address and the uh, SPB uh, device at the edge uh, and then of course a unicast packet can now flow back uh, on the shortest path and at that point we've now learned the uh, association in both directions and unicast traffic can flow in both directions encapsulated MAC and MAC uh, with the, uh, the host address is uh, encapsulated in, a, in a, just another layer of MAC but as I pointed out using that lovely big uh, 24-bit uh, ICID, uh, getting us away from the uh, 4K limitations of, uh, of uh, the current VLAN. So this is a slide I've shown a few times and, and uh, kind of like this one. It just shows the corridor of ECMP available to 802.1aq between a variety of different sources. So it's just circling around showing different sources and destinations. And that corridor is completely available to you for your traffic. Um, one of the things that we do here is we assign the traffic to the path at the head end so it's not being continuously reassigned as you go. We call that rifle forwarding. It's like aiming exactly where you want to send the packet and you shoot it through. And I'll use this in contrast later to a shotgun type of forwarding when we, we talk more about Trill. 
So here, uh, here's an example of that, uh, the ECMP behavior in a two-layer uh, DC fabric. This is a 16-node uh, spine and 32-node uh, 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 aggregation. Um, and what we're seeing here in the, the upper right-hand picture, I don't know if my mouse will work here, here it is, yeah. Here's the source and here's the destination for Unicast and we're seeing all 16 ECMP paths superimposed. They're all available to you. And here we're seeing one of the multicast trees, uh, one of the uh, multicast trees, uh, which is available for, um, uh, well, for multicast, of course. And <laughs> All 16 of the, the important point being that all 16 of those spine nodes are available as replication points. So we can support multicast and we can also support multicast ECMP and we can use each of those different uh, 16 uh, shortest path trees for multicast. So our multicast is not only um, congruent to the unicast, it's also shortest path. Um, so uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the OANM capabilities, I mentioned the, 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 the fact that we are building on top of 802.1 AG. So the entire uh, protocol suite, and Srikanth is going to talk a little bit more about this, but basically the, the continuity checks, the loop back, the trace routes, the discovery protocols, performance monitoring, all of that stuff is designed to work transparently to the protocol 802.1 AQ and in fact to work with the protocol. So there shouldn't be any surprises there. And as I said, thousands of, uh, of man years of effort have gone into this, uh, into this protocol suite. So I'll, uh, I guess I'll turn it over to Srikanth, who's going to talk a little bit more about deployment experience and OANM. Hi, I'm going to talk a little about uh, deployment experience with SPB, with the Mac and Mac data planes, and 802.1 AG and how all three of them work together and how each one of them does not invalidate uh, the work that was done on the other standards, right? So uh, I'll kind of look at uh, some of the OAM capabilities here. Uh, what, what, what do service providers want to do? They want to they run uh, reachability tests in the network. They, can they reach a foreign device? And here's, uh, sorry, here's, a, here's a unicast reachability test. You're trying to do ping from this device to this device here, ESP, and saying, run, 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 run a unicast test for me, right? So, and you can run this test with uh, one ping, or you can run this test with 10 pings. Here's, uh, here's unicast uh, trace route at, uh, running natively at layer two. You got, you got network, you got the shortest path highlighted in red here, right? The, the, red, the red links are, are the shortest path links, and what you're seeing here is uh, from this switch, I want to find the path to this switch, and I want to do it in day the path. I don't want to trust what my control plane is telling me, that what the path is, but I want to validate it for myself. 100% uh, self goes the same fate sharing as what your data traffic does, and here's what you see. The, the, the output of this command here shows you, you're starting at EL2, you're going to EVS, which is one hop away, you're going to CS0, second hop, and finally the destination, the third hop, ESP, right? Well, SPB also does uh, multicast trees. It can build a very efficient multicast trees, and uh, the customers want to know what my multicast tree looks like, and I want to see and trace, again, this multicast tree using the same exact forwarding records that I use for my data traffic. I don't want to trust my control plane. I want to verify where my traffic is going. Okay, here's, here's, a, here's the multicast tree for this node, EL2, that is built in red here, right? We're going to issue a command for a particular service instance that's using that multicast tree. Uh, in this case, it's ICIT 5010 is the number we've chosen. And issue a command here that shows layer two trace tree on algorithm number 10, ICIT 510, service, service instance 5010, right? Here's what you see. You see a fork at EL2, right? So this is, this is corresponding to this fork here. Then you're going to see a fork at EVS, which is where the tiebreaker is taking it for this particular algorithm. And once it reaches CS0 and CS1, you have a single hop to the leaf node of the tree, ESS and ESP, right? So that's, that's what you're seeing here. The next one, okay, I can see the multicast tree from the root of the tree, but I, I'm not at the root of the tree. I'm on this node here, and I want to trace uh, the remaining portion of the tree. Okay. His, uh, Here's what you got. You got, you, you got a tree that goes 
completes the rest of the tree. EVS is the first half for the second portion of the tree, and it just goes forward. Here's, uh, here's a multicast uh, tree trace from the leaf node. You're, you're logging on the leaf node and saying, can I look at the multicast tree? And it's saying, you're the leaf node. There's no more tree left behind you, right? A little bit more about the experience on uh, where uh, shortest path bridging is. It's currently deployed, currently deployed in live networks, service provider, and enterprises. It's deployed in mesh topologies. It's deployed in ring topologies. It's deployed in hierarchical ring topologies. Deployed in government networks. Uh, we have one municipal area network that we have deployed it in. Uh, it's providing residential aggregation services as well as business data services. And it, at the edge, it can support any kind of access network. It can support, uh, it does not preclude you from using your proprietary access networks at the edge, or you could use spanning tree, or you could ring, use uh, proprietary ring technologies. So I just got uh, told I need to make this a little quick, which is good. I only have four slides, so I'll wrap it up with a summary as best I can. Uh, so to continue and basically highlight what uh, both Peter and Shikant said, short path bridging is uh, well known in the industry uh, for its IEEE basis. You know, we've been uh, rather surprised about the interest we've seen out of data centers, in particular with the, uh, the MAC and MAC encapsulation because it allows the networks to scale uh, to some extremely large size and allow that the, uh, the switches in the network and the routers in the network don't ever have to really learn the, uh, the server MACs, but yet we can support an exponential number of servers like we could, than we could in the past. One thing actually I was going to try out here is that there's a lot more work going on than basic uh, layer two. And if you come from a routing background, you tend to think of Ethernet as something, something that connects your routers together. But these environments allow, especially in data centers or metros or residentials, to grow some pretty large layer two domains because Moore's law has been extremely co uh, kind to us. So it gets us to the point where the design of the SPB in the IEEE has been looking at this so that we can go from small layer two networks of two switches to thousand switches and scale in place with simply a software upgrade of the switches in place. It's uh, using an existing Ethernet control plane, and it provides in the protocol ability not only to do just a, a LAN topology, but also a E-tree topology, a line topology. Now, what gets interesting is because we're using ISIS and the basic construction of what we've done to the FIBs of these switches, they're actually acting like MPLS. And it's no surprise, considering that most people working on this in the IEEE well, all of us actually happen to have a lot of the patents behind MPLS and VPLS and GMPLS. So from the very beginning, there's been a lot of thought about the operational models behind what these networks will look like. We have people from data centers, we have people from metros, we have people from residential environments all looking at this saying, how do we scale this and how do we make it better? But we also look as we can do more because it's ISIS. We can actually provide IPVPNs on this. We're using that, a value called an ICID, which is basically, think of it like the next generation of a VLAN, but it gives you 16 million services instead of 4,000. And by the way, because of it's an ICID sitting there, it means that we can do 4,000 VLANs on any port attached to an ICID and rewrite the vid going in and out any port. So the whole VLAN scale issue, gone. Um, but we can also do IP routing. And it built into it, because it's operating like MPLS, it natively extends an MPLS network. Right, so it really nicely plugs into a very large network. And in and itself, especially when you think about it working with PBVPLS or the IPVPNs, it's a standard and native way that you could actually right now today in a lot of environments run this, extend a data center to data center connectivity so that two racks and two different data centers would think they're locally connected together using standard Ethernet forwarding back and forth. So it gets pretty nice if you think about all the deployment models that are available here. Now one thing that might not be clear is Peter talked about the rifle shot mentality. There's a lot of nice things you can actually derive out of that because of that rifle shot mentality. Is, and we you also notice, I know you at the top of this thing called SPB-M, because there's two modes to SPB. There's this V mode and M mode. V mode simply says it's standard Ethernet, standard VLAN control, and we can go up to 4,000 to 4,000 control inside the environment. So if you don't want to use PBB, don't use PBB. Use regular Ethernet. If you want to use PBB because you're worried about the scale or you want to separate the server max from your actual switches, so if you look at this and you were to think of this two switches on left and right, or excuse me, two servers, the switch in the middle, C, never sees any of the Macs from any of the servers or any of the PCs, none of it. It's completely hidden from the server's perspective. They can't hack into it, they can't see it, they can't do anything to it. What's also interesting is that because that ISID, that 201 for example, it provides a very interesting thing. It's what triggers the multicast state. 
and it's announced in ISIS like an IP route. And that's a very important thing to realize is that we didn't change anything in ISIS because most of us have deployed ISIS. I myself have worked in some pretty large environments in both tier one carriers as well as enterprises that ran ISIS. We know how good it is. We know all of its warts and we know all of its, its benefits. We did not want to change the protocol and we didn't. We simply just added a simple TLV that triggers an optimized Dijkstra that then gives us a shortest path multicast tree and the unicast is just a subset of that. But the rifle shot provides another benefit. If you think about all the work we're doing also now at Triple E on fiber channel of Ethernet, it provides a perfect environment for a deterministic path for fiber channel Ethernet built in. Go back to also all the O&M that we have available to us from 802.1ag and Y17. We've brought forward all the Sonnet O&M to Ethernet. And it's well deployed. We have networks running all over the world with it right now, which means that we also get a lot of the Sonnet O&M that we, ha we expected for fiber channel right on top of Ethernet and it's already there and well deployed. Bugs already nicely worked out. One other thing that's kind of interesting about this that's hidden inside the, uh, the draft and most people don't really know it's there is this ability to reuse this ISID. You know, if you remember I said it automatically creates this multicast state in the background and you can basically tell it to use a lot or use a little. But in particular this one little benefit we have there is that we call it a default tree. It means is that we basically create a tree in the background that acts kind of like a bear channel for just these nodes. And what they do is they basically just join a tree and they sit there quietly. But it's used particularly just for link state updates. So the nodes just naturally will always do the standard hop by hop, share their link state advertisement to each other. That's not changed. This is an additive. So what happens if a link fails like between these two switches in the middle, it'll actually, these nodes will take their link state update and drop it on the tree, which means basically every single node that's participating in this network learns about that failure at nearly the same time and reconverges the network completely in one time. Most tests that we've seen that actually ran this thing were showing that we could actually converge a fairly large network of 100 switches or more in less than 30 milliseconds. It was very interesting to watch that because only the paths that were affected and only the services that were affected had to reroute. So to wrap up, one of the things uh, you got to look at this is we see a lot of interest in this thing for a, a lot of paths. And you can see we're sharing a lot of paths here in their, in their rifle shot. But that doesn't stop us from also doing a shotgun effect. So we can do both actually with SPB because we did it in more of an MPLS like fashion. Very aware of what a service is. Making VPNs kind of bring them to Ethernet, right? So that when you configure an ISID, it is literally like a service of VPN. Even though it's an ELAN, you can use it and think of it just as you would any other uh, Ethernet switch out in the world today. And the design intent is that in the five to ten years and you go to your favorite vendor to buy a switch and you plug in your network, it will be running SPB by default instead of spanning tree. Because what it nicely does is it basically obsoletes MSTP, RSTP, MVRP, MMRP and you just can keep going on that laundry list all in one nice shot, one in nice protocol, just turn it on and it runs. And, but that's not the end of it. Because it's ISIS, we have all the things we have in MPLS aware to us, colored links colored pools. We can just do a lot of the things you can, we do in MPLS and we can actually apply it to Ethernet in these paths too. So the one thing to realize too, if you hadn't caught on yet, all these switches are running without broadcast, not flooding learning. They are, all of their FIBs are explicitly controlled, right? But we still allow the flood and learn on top from the server. So there's no change in Ethernet. And because it's standard Ethernet control plane, it just works. Switches that have been around for 30 years just basically need a software update and they switch natively on Ethernet. So, is that fast enough? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Donald Eastlake, uh, co chair of the IETF Trail Working Group. I'd like to recommend that people do look at the tutorial material from yesterday. I gave uh, much more there and I'll only just be able to touch the surface here. And you're welcome to look at the shortest path bridging tutorial from yesterday also. So what is this drill thing? It's this it's a new standard protocol, does layer two bridging, but it really uses ISIS link state routing to accomplish that. It's a good trick. Invented by Radio Perlman, somebody you may have heard of. She invented spanning tree quite a while ago, done a lot of work in link state routing and actually ISIS is uh, her invention because she uh, designed DECnet phase four, uh, phase five rather, and ISIS is really just a copy of that. So you've already heard the acronym explained and uh, I'm a co-chair because Eric Nordmark is my uh, other half. Uh, there's a couple terms that you may hear. Our bridge is a routing bridge that's a device that implements 
drill protocol. And our bridge campus is an assemblage of our bridges, links, and you can have uh, bridges in there too. And it's bounded by end stations or routers. So an our bridge campus is to our bridges the same as a bridged LAN is to bridges. So what's the idea here? It's a very simple idea. I think all great ideas are very simple. You take native frames from end stations. You encapsulate them in a transport header with a hop count. You then route them using essentially normal routing techniques based on a, a shortly short tag indicating where they should go uh, in terms of our bridges. And then you decapsulate them and deliver them. So that's the idea. So we chose uh, ISIS, so it's part of the original design really because of two reasons, rather than OSPF, which you might think the IETF would prefer to use since the IETF designed OSPF. ISIS runs directly at layer two, so you don't require any IP addresses. Uh, you would inspect in the real world that our bridges would typically have an IP address for management or other reasons, but they don't require it. They can come up, find each other, start routing um, without there being any IP addresses or IP in the area. And uh, it has a very flexible data format, so it's easy to add new kinds of fields you want and things like that. So it does lots of great things for you, optimum point-to-point -point forwarding. I'll go through this real quick because I think you guys know all about this kind of stuff. So we have three bridges here. You run spanning tree, it works by turning off ports. You can't use that bottom link. Uh, you, your frames do not follow optimal routes from B2 to B3. They got to go via B1. However, if you replace these with our bridges, then all the links are available, stuff follows the optimal route, and if you don't have something which specially requires configuration, like if you didn't have any uh, particular VLANs things here, you could do this with no uh, configuration effort or anything. Just upgrade your bridges to our bridges, and there you are. Uh, it does multi-pathing, so it's, it's a very s simplified uh, data center kind of diagram. If you have a bunch of paths disabled by spanning tree, you typically can only get one path uh, between two points, but with our bridges, you can easily get multiple paths. So they, that's actually uh, optional, but I don't know of anybody implementing trailer R bridges that's not planning to provide that uh, feature. So they're, they're compatible with classic bridges. So if you have an existing uh, bridge LAN, you can replace classic bridges with our bridges. And uh, it's recommended you do that in such a way as to divide up your bridge LAN into uh, small islands. Uh, to reduce the size of your spanning trees, uh, it'll basically reduce the problems from a spanning tree, uh, decrease settling time, and so forth. Uh, the forwarding tables at our bridges are uh, the scale with a number of our bridges. Uh, they don't our bridges in the interior of a our bridge campus, so don't need to learn end station addresses. Only the edge our bridges need to learn that. Uh, the Trill Protocol has an options feature, and one of the interesting things is because of the link state database, you can tell what options other arbitrages support. So if you're thinking of using one, this feature hasn't been used very much so far, but if you were, then you would be able to tell whether the destination supported that feature before you actually composed or sent a frame there. And does uh, optimize distribution of IP-derived multicast uh, automatically is uh, another optional feature, which I believe every, most every implementer of arbitrages is planning to include. So there's lots of great features about bridges. You know, they, they're transparent. They got all this plug and play. They have support for virtual LANs, useful in lots of ways. Uh, they have frame priorities and actually sort of building on those priorities as kind of channel indicators. There's the data center bridging features, which uh, let you sort of allocate bandwidth and um, prioritize things in various ways and um, de decrease or eliminate a loss of frames due to queue congestion. And uh, they're currently under development for various virtualization support to edge virtual bridging stuff. But routers really have lots of great features too. I mean, just from the beginning there, they do great multi-pathing, uh, find optimal paths, do rapid failover. They also have a safety of a TTL, which I think is pretty important. Uh, many uh, proofs or indications that some routing or forwarding system is guaranteed to work uh, depend on this small assumption that the control plane is still operating. Uh, so, but in modern things are so complex, sometimes the control plane crashes, but the data plane keeps working. Uh, and typically the implementation of the TTL reduction and discard is in the fast path, so that can save you uh, even if your control plane isn't working anymore in some particular box. And the, typically they support options. So our bridges are really a great combination of all these features from both bridges and routers. Uh, so you look at an R bridge campus, there's various different kinds of frames. There's the ISIS control frames, so a trill ISIS between the R bridges. There's the encapsulated data. 
There's uh, still some layer two control frames sort of on the physical links, uh, things supporting um, LLDP and stuff like that. Uh, one thing I should mention is that our bridges and trail are really built uh, on top of 802.1Q ports. So you can, uh, for the most part, assume that the ports have all the features uh, and you can add various optional features like MACSAC or whatever, uh, link aggregation, all that stuff is kind of below trail and you can do all those kinds of great things. And uh, then there's native frames, which are the real end station traffic, which is uh, essentially what you have if it's not one of the trill frames or one of the layer two control frames. So this is what a, a trill frame looks like between two R bridges. Uh, there could just be a wire between those R bridges or there could be an arbitrary ethernet cloud with 802.1D and 802.1Q bridges and who knows what between them. So you have the original frame, you have the trill header, and you have a link transport header. And this shows an ethernet link transport header, and it sort of shows a VLAN ID there, but you don't need that VLAN ID if it's point to point or anything. You only need that VLAN ID if there's like carrier ethernet facilities in the way that restrict your VLAN or some other restrictions on VLANs. And you could use other kinds of uh, links between two R bridges. It could be a PPP link or something like that, in which case you would have a different link transport header. So this uh, data is, is encapsulated, as shown on the previous page, and that, that link header is really just to get it from uh, the transport header, just to get it from one R bridge to the next R bridge. Uh, and it's unicast address for unicast frames and multicast address for multi-destination frames like broadcast or multicast frames. And uh, the trill header, which I'll show in a second, specifies with the first R bridge the frame hit, where it was ingressed uh, or encapsulated, uh, then the last one where it's going to be uh, egressed or decapsulated back to native form for delivery except in case of multi-destination frames, in which case that same field actually indicates uh, a distribution tree that the frame is sent on. So here's what this actual trill header looks like. Um, it has an ether type uh, if you're sending it on ethernet. It's got the usual kinds of versions and uh, hop count. It has the uh, nicknames for the ingress and egress, and those are auto-configured. You don't have to worry about them at all. They, uh, our bridges come up with those by themselves. And uh, there's... Uh, one bit which indicates whether it's a unicast or a uh, multi-destination frame. So uh, trill data frames that have known unicast ultimate destinations are just routed really hop by hop with standard routing techniques. Uh, if they're multi-destination, they're forwarded on a distribution tree, as I said, by the ingress arbitrage that selects the distribution tree and, and the frame then follows that tree. Uh, in the case of a multi-destination, there's a reverse path forwarding check. Because uh, multi-destination frames are potentially more dangerous. You can have forks in the distribution tree and the frame could multiply, so you need more control over it. Uh, the distribution trees can be pruned, which basically just means that, that the tree is all still there, but it just means you don't send the frame down some particular branch uh, based on VLAN or multicast group or things like that if you don't see any listeners uh, down that branch. And it's, it's important to keep in mind these distribution trees are campus-wide, shared, bi-directional trees. They're not restricted in any particular way, each of these distribution trees. Uh, the trill defaults to one, but you can configure your campus to calculate as many as you like. So in the sort of way things peer, uh, you know, things at the same level can peer, but if typically lower level things like bridges can't peer through higher level entities like routers, well, with our bridges, you sort of have a new layer in the middle. Essentially, looking downwards from a router all the assemblage of our bridges and bridges looks transparent, pretty much. But if you look upward from a bridge, the R bridges look like routers. They terminate the spanning tree, uh, and uh, otherwise they look like end stations from the point of view of bridges. So things can peer, like, as shown here, but not peer through higher level entities like that. So one way that uh, Trill actually teaches, treats VLANs uh, somewhat differently from bridges is that it tries really hard to glue together all the end stations in a particular VLAN within a campus. So if you have two end stations that have access to an R bridge in the campus and they're in the same VLAN, then they will be able to communicate with each other. So if you had a previous bridged LAN and you replace all the bridges with R bridges, a good thing to do, uh, if they were previously VLAN islands, they will be glued together. And most customers think this is a, a good thing. Uh, but there is a feature uh, you, which you can you do to divide your campus into regions such that uh, VLAN IDs are translated as they cross the inter-region boundary. Um, and uh, if we would desire, you can block traffic uh, at that boundary so that a particular VLAN is actually divided into two different islands. 
And uh, this really just affects the uh, border R bridges. You just have to configure them. The R bridges in the interior of a region don't even know this is going on. And it has absolutely no effect on optimal paths, distribution trees, or anything else. The frames follow exactly the same path as they would before. It's just that as they actually transit a border between regions, you can provide for mapping of VLAN ID or priority or uh, dropping of the frame. So, of course, uh, Spanning Tree Protocol had a poem called Algorime, which uh, you can easily find on the internet if you do a search. And uh, since Radio Divide decided Design Trill, she thought it clearly needed a new poem. So we have Algorime version two. And uh, instead of her writing it, she had uh, her son write it. So um, I'll leave it as an exercise to you to, to read this uh, or, uh, or find it, it, it by searching for Algorime v2, I guess. Um, this is a quick thing on data center bridging. They, Cisco uh, coined the phrase data center ethernet, and they uh, initially used that to refer to uh, th four things, really. Priority-based flow control, which is known as per-priority pause, enhanced transmission selection, uh, congestion notification, and trill. And, and the first three of these are really what's uh, referred to as data center bridging. And uh, those three features, I don't want to go into detail, but they're really pretty much implementable in the queuing structure inside ports. And they can really be implemented inside the ports on most any kind of box. Um, you know, be, be thought of initially as bridges, because they're called data center bridging, but you can do them on R bridges. You can do it on, uh, to some extent on end stations, depending on which feature you're talking about, or routers or whatever. It depends uh, uh, a little bit. And so all these can really be implemented uh, below trail in, in the ports on an R bridge and support that with one corner case related to congestion notification. Uh, so there is a minor extension to trill, and there's a draft uh, explaining how to, to do that. Um, where if you have a, a bridge in between two R bridges, notices congestion, and generates a congestion notification message, it'll generate it to the uh, previous hop R bridge, which has to do uh, a little bit of modification to the frame to actually get it back to the original source of that flow and try to restrain the flow to uh, reduce congestion. So data center bridging is uh, supported by R bridges. And actually, I usually attend the data center bridging session, so I, I'm in the next room when these guys are in the uh, other room where the shortest path bridging work is going on. So just a little on the standardization status. As usual, it took like an absurdly long time to, to get to the current state of standardization for this. Um, the first Trill working group meeting was in March of 2005, and the working group was essentially through with the uh, base protocol in December 2009. And the uh, official announcement that the drill-based protocol spec was an approved uh, IETF standard came out on March 15th. Uh, there will be references, I guess, at the end of all this, which include a reference to the uh, document which was approved. Uh, there have been ether types assigned. There's a block of multicast addresses assigned, of which is a block of 16. Uh, only uh, three of them are currently in use for anything in drill, but the others are available for extensions. The network layer protocol ID. The only thing remaining is uh, final approval of the ISIS code points and data structures. There has been, uh, the, the, although those uh, ISIS data points and uh, code structures are, are in some sense pending, they've been stable for long enough that there's lots of implementations going on. There's been a uh, publicly announced interop uh, plug fest at the University of New Hampshire Interoperability Laboratory, which was at the beginning of August, and uh, they're working on scheduling another one. And there's ongoing work in a lot of areas. Okay, so there's, there's now uh, some comparison section, so um, I'm going to start with uh, some comparisons between Trill and Shortest Path Bridging. So uh, it's possible that I've made some errors in this because uh, I know more about Trill than I know about the latest state of Shortest Path Bridging. It's kind of a moving target. Um, but I'll just go ahead here. So frame overhead, that's one question. Well, so these things add these additional headers and stuff like that. What's, what's this all really cost? Well, uh, if you assume you have point-to-point -point Ethernet links and uh, you're doing multipathing and stuff like that, with Trill, it takes 20 bytes extra stuff. You got outer MAC addresses and you got the Trill header, which takes eight bytes for the Trill header. So my calculations show that SPBM in that case is 22 bytes. It's not a big difference, but it's a little bit more. And I have the arithmetic here as to what is added or subtracted for various tags and, and so on. Um, so, okay, that's uh, in the, that case. What if you have like a complex multi-access links and, uh, with multi-pathing and, and things are going on and you, maybe you need the outer trill um, 
uh, VLAN tag because it's, there's complex VLAN filtering happening or something. So that, that bumps up the trill thing to 24 bytes. So as far as I know, SPBM just doesn't work on multi-axis links. So it's hard to do the comparison in that case. Um, I didn't, I was only talking about SPBM because uh, there's, there's actually two modes, quite added complexity, SPBV has these two different modes that, you know. And in SPBVM, the uh, other mode, uh, I just want to mention the, that the like last time I saw this, it appeared that it consumed VLAN IDs at a cubic rate, okay? So, you know, if you had N nodes and you wanted to handle V real VLANs and do K-way multi-pathing, it took N times V times K distinct VLAN IDs or like, you know, a lot. So I don't think it scales very well, but anyway. Um, routing computation. Uh, so that's something that might be important. So what, what does that take? So uh, one, by the way, one great thing about uh, spanning tree, I mean spanning tree does have good features, is that uh, as, as per the directions given to her by her supervisor over 25 years ago, uh, Radio was told to come up with something that would let you hook Ethernet segments together that would scale as a constant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, something which seems absurd because that should, you know, but in fact, spanning free kind of scales as a constant and unless you, absur you assume things that are getting so big that like you have to make MAC addresses longer or something funny like that. So for practical purposes, a spanning tree scales as a constant. So Troll uses the usual Dijkstra kind of stuff, and if you optimize that calculation for unicast, you get basically n log n is the calculation. By the way, uh, for, for all these things with link state, the storage requirements of the node approximately are order n. So I'm talking about the, the computation uh, load. So, and you can do multipathing kind of automatically in Trill, you just keep track of the equal cost paths, which ports lead to equal cost paths, and it, it uh, doesn't add much. In Trill, if you're doing multi-destination multipathing, it's k times n times log n if you want to have k distribution trees. And, and there isn't really a reason to have a whole bunch of distribution peas. People tend to get confused about that. They didn't say, but, but don't you need lots of trees? Isn't there congestion at the root of the tree and stuff? Well, these are bi-directional trees. You don't send stuff to the root and have it redistribute or anything like that. Each uh, arbridge just injects it into the tree where it is on all the branches leading out of that arbridge. And so in the sort of the general case, the result is that, that uh, a broadcast frame, for example, sort of goes to every node, so it means it crosses every link exactly once, it means there's equal load everywhere in the tree. Um, that's a simplification and there's some second order effects. Um, so there is a feature where you can have more trees. You can even have multiple trees rooted at the same arbridge if you want to use different equal cost path trees out of that one, one because one particular node is a, a very large source or sink for multi-destination traffic. So what's the story on shortest path bridging? Well, uh, I understand they're working on improving this, but for unicast and multicast, they're really kind of com unified, so that's, that's a good thing. But, but the cost is really k n squared log n, where you're doing uh, k-way multipathing. Um, and k is currently, at least uh, in the spec draft, limited to 16. So, you know, it's really not much multipathing. And it's very, you know, I mean, so, so let's, they're talking about a thousand node network. So that means every, you know, well, maybe you can simplify it. They have found some optimizations, but at least some boxes are doing three orders of magnitude more computation than Trill is to handle a thousand nodes. I, maybe that has some significance. Um, so I'd also like to just do a brief comparison of the way these protocols have evolved. Well, what are we going to do relative to the slide? Are they going to give their point or are they just going to answer me? I'm going to go to some questions because we're running a little bit tight on time. So I'm going to get to present this? Uh, was some, can we actually cut off the slides now and get to a couple No. no. <laughs> sorry, I'll go through these really quickly. I've, I've been told I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't sorry, notified or anything. So anyway, just real quick, the history. Radia invented the spanning tree and uh, she invented this whole concept of the, the, IS, the uh, Trill concept of transparent routing. So she gave a tutorial at 802, I know, because I arranged it, and in fact, they require more than one speaker, so we actually both spoke. I spoke about 2% of the time, and Radia spoke about 98% of the time. So 802 said, go away. She gave a boff at IETF, IETF thought it was good, they formed a working group. Uh, I say I'm going fast, so what happened to, in uh, Trill? So her idea was accepted, the basic idea is very simple, I gave it a four, shortest path transparent frame routing, using real routing, using ISIS and encapsulation with a hop count. So early on, data, additional data plane learning was added, the VLAN support was all added, 
And, you know, in the future I suspect that something like ICID support will be added, but I don't want to speculate too much about things that haven't actually happened. Um, it was found after uh, about 18 months ago that there was uh, a need to add some MTU robustness, and that's been added. So uh, Trill actually has facilities so you can like track all the MTUs on your links. You can report them in the link state. You can do traffic engineering so you can select routes that support jumbo frames, all kinds of great stuff. And in the future, more stuff will be added, I'm sure. So last slide. What happened in, S in uh, the, resolution, the evolution of SPB? So radio's ideas were rejected. Basically, that was there. People said there isn't really a problem. I mean, who needs more than 65 trees you have with multiple spanning tree? And if you do, maybe you can do spanning tree per VLAN. You know, troll is probably a terrible idea. Spanning tree is great. Routing is terrible. Hop counts are bad. I hear people say that. But the IETF formed a working group. Hey, that's a challenge, you know? So they decide, well, actually, maybe there really is a problem. So they spin up 802.1aq, and the initial idea was perfectly clear. I mean, it's not in the charter, but you can see the initial stuff. Initially, 802.1aq was going to be based on a huge number of spanning trees, because spanning trees are good and routing is bad. But, well, you know, uh, and it's, and it, by the way, when I say they say, this is individuals. This is not the official word of 802.1. It's not, they're more polite than that. So, so but, but actually, that turned out to be a problem. So they decided, actually, spanning tree really doesn't hack it, even though that was the initial idea for 802.1aq. So we'll start cribbing more from Trill. So they start using ISIS and nicknames. They call them uh, SP source IDs. Uh, but, but they don't really do routing. They just use that to configure this bridging stuff. And they still say, you know, Trill's not so good. Some individuals, um, and not, not the individuals present here, I have to admit, who are, are excellent people. Um, and uh, the latest thing is, They've figured out that 16-way multipathing just doesn't hack it. They can't multipath enough. You know, they're trying to figure out ways to make it multipath better. The link agreement protocol they have, which is a critical part of it, they didn't mention, you know, hasn't really been tried much. It's very complicated. They're trying to find out some way to fix that or, or you know, shoehorn TTLs into it, even though m m most people in 802.1 that I've talked to believe that TTLs are still bad and, and that, uh, you know, they're not really effective and stuff. But, but you know... <laughs> They're, they're really kind of like, they've got to figure out some way to catch up the trail. So uh, that's my view. <laughs> Thank you very much, Donald. Appreciate that. Yeah, water. Okay. So um, just before we, because uh, um, we're short on time, I just want to give you guys an opportunity to respond to some of the last points that Donald made before I ask a few uh, kind of acute, few leading questions. Sure. Well, I mean, the, the, one of the points that that comes up fairly frequently is this whole business of computational complexity. And um, when we first started working on 802.1aq, yeah, it was, it was something that we were, we were concerned about. And then we actually tried implementing it. We sat down, we wrote code, we optimized it on some of these uh, two and four gigahertz multi-core processors that are making their way into the, uh, the kinds of switches that we have. And lo and behold, we were able to do four or 500 node networks with tens of thousands of services, and they were completing in 10, 20 millisecond calculation times or, or less. So there are, um, it's very important when you, when you throw up these order of, uh, order of calculation uh, comparisons that you understand what those n's are and what those k's are and exactly what kind of computational power you're working with. I mean, if we were always worried about uh, using our CPUs to do anything, we wouldn't waste CPU on the user interfaces on these things, and what a horrible waste that would be. So, uh, you know, if you're really concerned about it, go look at the IEEE um, website. There's a series of presentations that were made on the computational complexity. We brought all kinds of examples. We ran it on, I don't know, how many different processors? Um, and so for the, the scales of networks that we're interested in, it, it really did not concern us after we actually implemented it. The other thing that I would bring up is that the computations are producing useful state. If you're going to do the computation and you're going to produce multicast state on those kinds of scales, every single one of those forwarding entries is saving you bandwidth somewhere. If you don't want to do it, the option is there to turn off the multicast replication at the transit points and do head-end replication just as you do with VPLS. And in that case, by the way, the computation is less than Trill. So that's, that's my point about computation. I really hope we can move on from that to, to something more productive because there are much bigger issues at stake here. This is really, in my book, an issue about the Ethernet frame, the Ethernet work, all of the work that's gone on over the last 30 years on Ethernet 
do we want to continue that work? Do we want to make some small changes to it where necessary? If there are some changes required, IEEE is perfectly willing to do that. Yes, you have to sit down and you have to be willing to work carefully and politely and quietly at the IEEE, um, but it's possible to do it. Um, so that's the first thing. Do we want to change, do we want to create a brand new encapsulation? Do you want a new encapsulation in your network? Um, do you want brand new OANM that doesn't exist? Their, their slides are way better than our existing implementations, I'll grant you that, although I haven't even seen the slides, but I'm sure they're better. So we have years and years and years of Ethernet OANM, you're all probably using it. Do you want to continue using it or do you want something brand new? I don't want something brand new, I want to build on it, I want to solve more interesting problems than OANM. Look at what's going on in MPLS, we've got brand new OANM, it's still ongoing. It's a very, very lengthy exercise to introduce. There are thousands and thousands of man years involved. Sure, there are lots of other small minor differences and some not so minor differences between what 802.1eq and shortest path bridging are doing. But there are big overarching considerations here with respect to continuing our work on Ethernet, preserving our work on Ethernet, and moving it forward. The IEEE is perfectly willing to do that. Um, there are probably lots of other points. I know if one of you guys want to want to step in. Actually, uh, let me let me roll to one uh, quick question. Um, Donald, can you speak to OANM and um, how Trill handles that? Hello. Is this on? Should be yeah. Oh, can you hear me out there? Okay, I, I can't. Oh, uh, oh, now it's now, uh, sorry. Uh, OANM. It's a great thing. You should have OANM. I, I agree with that. Um, and there are OAM drafts that haven't been posted that are in development. I mean, what do you do with ISIS for OAM? You're on BFD typically, right? You know, there's a draft on uh, BFD for Trill. BFD is a well-developed protocol. And there's a draft on other uh, facilities. And uh, these are new drafts. That's absolutely correct. But, you know, it doesn't seem completely like rocket science to me. So uh, that's what I have to say about OAM. Okay, thanks. Um, and a couple other, uh, let me just bring up a kind of list here, a couple leading questions. Um, question uh, was raised about intellectual property. So what's the, uh, what's the status of whether or not there are any, um, um, any, any rights or any limitations on intellectual property for the Trill implementation? Uh, sure. Uh, the original idea was uh, patented by Sun Microsystems and uh, Oracle, because of the acquisition, now owns that. Uh, and that patent and actually all other IPR that Sun owned is licensed uh, royalty-free worldwide in perpetuity as long as your implementation conforms to the IETF standard. And uh, similarly for um, SPB, are there any royalty considerations? Not that, not that I'm aware of. Um, obviously, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not allowed to speak on behalf of the company that I work for. Um, and I suspect that's true of every one of the panelists here. I'm making legal statements about specific products on specific companies is uh, it's outside of the realm of my, uh, my pay grade. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, all I wanted to say was that last time I checked, there were five different IPR filings with the IEEE related to 802.1AQ by five different companies. And I believe they were all reasonable non-discriminatory royalty bearing uh, disclosures. Standard, standard practice in the, in, the, in the standards bodies, but again, I'm, I'm... Standard practice in the IEEE, not standard practice in the IETF, which is much more allergic to patents than the IEEE. So I'm not really sure what the problem is. Every single routing protocol in the world that we all use day to day are all wrapped up in IPR. What's the, the problem? Honestly, I mean, MPLS, tons of patents. BPLS, tons of patents. IPVPNs, tons of patents by all companies, right? They're all going to be wrapped up. The users don't have to worry about them. The lawyers will take care of it. It's just like every Ethernet. The original Ethernet is still wrapped up. Spanning tree still has patents related to it. There's no big deal. There's those spanning tree patents that I'm aware of. Um, I'm going to roll the next uh, question. Question about uh, TTL. So um, uh, you guys are handling uh, TTL differently. What's the, uh, what's the take right now on SPB and the necessity for TTL to be handled? Take it no, you go. So TTL is this kind of interesting topic. Um, for years, because it basically means you've got to add a completely new enca header encapsulation, we're not against the TTL. It's just the point is that when we were working through the standard itself, we were more worried about making sure that, you know, one person put it really nicely. A TTL is not a solution to looping. A TTL is, is the mentioning how big you want your crater to be when a loop forms, right? So solve the damn problem of looping first. Make sure loops can occur. And if you want to put a TTL at the end when you're done as like an airbag, 
fine. It's a nice little thing to have at the end. But let's solve the actual looping issue in the beginning. So there's a lot of work that goes in that's in the actual spec to guarantee there's no looping inside of the, the network, you know, basically protecting against paths not being used for, uh, for forwarding that shouldn't be used. Right? And the, the drill take on DTL? It's routing. You know, you know how IP routing works, you know, uh, you know how ISIS routing works. The idea is very simple. You encapsulate the native frame in a header with a half count and you route it with a TTL, like routing. And then you decapsulate and deliver the native frame. TTLs are great. Except for multicast where you also do a reverse path forwarding check. That's correct. And uh, that I was simplifying by only speaking about unicast and then I explained in my talk why multicast is more dangerous and requires uh, greater care, but in both cases there's a TTL so, which so protects the, you from such disasters as a crash. So for the more plane. dangerous stuff you need a reverse path forwarding check which is in built addition, into shortest path bridging and is a, is a byproduct of the, uh, the symmetry of the routing. Exactly. One of the things that we've done is we've made sure that the routing is symmetric and congruent precisely so that we can use this extremely strong, which Donald just described, reverse path forwarding check not only for unicast and multicast. You actually need a simultaneous loop to form in both directions to break a reverse path forwarding check. Thank you. Uh, next question was actually regarding uh, symmetry. So is, uh, is symmetry uh, really necessary? Well, so symmetry is, it is necessary for a reverse path forwarding check, but it's also something which many people find desirable. I will, I will grant that there are lots of cases where symmetry and congruence are not necessarily something that, that is essential. However, there are a lot of cases where knowing exactly where your packets are going, being able to predict with an offline tool exactly where your packets are going to go, and looking at your network and seeing exactly, I mean, Srikanth gave a little demonstration where he showed the multicast tree looks exactly like your offline tool predicts. Your network does exactly what is supposed to be happening in your offline tool, and if there's ever a difference, there's a problem. The other thing is you can go to the core of the network and stick a probe in the network and look at a packet. You can see the source that it came from, the destination that it's going to, the service it's on, and the route that it's on, and it won't change. And the, That's a useful thing. And the, the symmetry view within drill? Uh, you, uh, you can tell what, pack, what path some frame is going to follow. I mean, it won't change unless in uh, drill either, unless there's some topology. Well, the hashing change, will you know? change it. What? The hashing will change it. What hashing? If there's no symmetry. Yeah, the paths are not guaranteed to be symmetric control. It's ISIS routing. It's just, you know, you know, IP paths are not guaranteed symmetric. This is, it, it uses ISIS in its way somewhat like IP. It's not actually routing on IP addresses because MAC addresses are a flat space and they're not hierarchical. But, you know, it's uh, somehow the world, internet gets along without all internet paths being symmetric and similar and, and so forth. Well, so I, I'm, I'm not against asymmetry. I'm saying that there's a case for both. Um, one of the analogies that I like to use is that there's this shotgun-based forwarding, which is spreading the traffic on, on multiple paths with ECMP, which results in asymmetry. And then there's the use of, of more careful symmetric routing to guarantee the, the symmetry and congruence. And we call one the shotgun and one the rifle. And when you go hunting, it's nice to be armed as, as well as you possibly can be. And I want a machine gun as well. And so I mean, there's a lot of work reasons we've done in MPLS. I mean, we all have seen the way we forward and do ECMP and MPLS. There's a lot of congruence in what we've done in the IEEE as well for this. Again, most of the people working on this came from an MPLS the development background. So as far as symmetry goes, is it required? No, but we look at it as a nice way of guaranteeing a uh, you know, loop-free environment. And there's actually quite a bit of work going in saying, well, if you want to do a shotgun effect, you can ease up those restraints and do it if you'd like. Okay. Thank you. So we're running a little time on time. I'm just going to ask one more question here. Um, it's regarding uh, scale. Um, you, you'd mentioned uh, 16 million uh, with ICIDs, and you'd mentioned uh, NICs, which I believe go to uh, 64,000. What's what's the uh, what's the um, what what are the scaling some of the scaling limitations as far as number of paths go, number of unique? Uh, I'm going to start with on the troll side. Uh, oh well, um, the um, I mean the routing. Uh, I, I spoke about the routing calculate computations and stuff like that. I mean, so I don't know that there's that much difference actually in the uh, in the number of switch kind of things, other than the higher computation requirements. Um, in, in terms of um, number of uh, you know the, the 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 real question I think you're asking is related to VLANs and ICIDs. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. number so, of VLANs yeah. and services. Yeah. So currently, Trill is VLAN based, and uh, it's quite clear. 
but uh, I believe that uh, Trill is uh, easily extended to uh, be able to handle an uh, equivalent of ICID. and uh, But that would be something which has not yet happened, so that's all I can Are really we going to invent Mac and Mac again? What? Are you going to invent Mac and Mac again with a new ICID? Uh, no, not necessarily. How about the same ICID? I don't know. Uh, and from the uh, SPB side? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll answer to that. Uh, ICITS has a number space 2 power 24. Have we tested uh, what, what the scalings we tested in live networks and test topologies in our labs? We've been able to drop 100,000 multicast trees on our switches in the core links. And as a comparison, that's uh, one multicast tree for everybody in a decent sized city and their family members. I mean, that's when you, you, you're not even touching IEEE on multicast scaling. And this, is, and this isn't just lab numbers, we could, we could put them in live networks, and they are running in live networks right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me give uh, just uh, two minutes for uh, closing remarks. Um, if you gentlemen want to select someone to give a two-minute closing. I guess I get elected to do the summary. Um, so I'll just reiterate what's already been said in a lot of cases. I mean, I, I personally, as, as an individual, don't see what the big debate is about this. The Ethernet has been owned by IEEE for many years. There's a lot of changes that are going on in IEEE beyond even what we're talking about with SPB. We're doing a lot of work on new access links and technologies with, you know, VDP and even all the, the – the standards that uh, Don put up there a second ago of ETS, PFC, and all those other things for data center Ethernet, those are all being done in the IEEE, right? Every single one of the meetings that we go to, we sit there in a room with the data center guys and us, all working through the standards, and we've already done cross changes back and forth with each other. So as these things continue to change, you're going to have to constantly upgrade and look at the protocols. And one thing that is, is kind of missing out of this debate is the fact that we took the basis, because the IEEE has been working on Ethernet for over 30 years, we had to make sure that what we were doing would work with 30 years of Ethernet, so in place. So not to force you to upgrade and rip and replace networks, because obviously that's not going to happen. Right. So the intent is basically from a migration path, you simply would just turn on another VLAN that's running SPB and turn on another set of VLANs that's running F uh, SPB. And from a multipathing basis, we can go from 2, 16, and even at the last IEEE meeting, there was a, uh, an option put in there for an infinite number of ECMP paths if there was an infinite number of paths available. And the reason why is because we made it very modular. You can plug in any multipathing algorithm, and it's, it's basically just a little TLV in there that sets which one you're doing. So as far as extensibility, scale, I mean, it, as we've been looking at this thing, we look at pretty much any environment you can imagine wanting to deploy Ethernet in on a large scale that support IP. And I think it shows from the scale we've seen in actually in live deployments already. Thank you. And uh, Donald from the Trill side? Hi. So I, I guess it's really true. Certainly, I, I, IEEE 802.1 has been uh, essentially blinded by radius brilliance in the invention of STP for over 25 years and uh, was really unable to see anything outside of that until she came up with this idea. And they're, they're madly busy, you know, trying to leverage as much of it as they can without really uh, taking the whole of her uh, genius in inventing Trill. In inventing Trill. Great. Well, uh, th uh, thank you very much, folks. Uh, as, as I mentioned at the end of the slides uh, that are online, there are some references that were provided by uh, both, uh, both groups here. So uh, just to recap what we have going on for you this evening, um, first of all, um, please, if you have a moment, sometime between the break or between the uh, evening events, hit that survey. Uh, it's good for you, good for us. We have the vendor collaboration room that begins um, right after the break here, and that is um, through the elevators and to the right. We have the beer and gear at 6 p.m. in the exhibit hall, which is through the elevators, and I think to the left you'll find it. Through the, oh, it's, sorry, that direction. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, this evening at 8.30 p.m., we have the evening social at Shout. I'm going to thank you, uh, Telex and Cisco and ATT America, for sponsoring that. That should be it for this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>